Now, the full impact of the fire in January 2000 flowed from the capacity of the burning bush, the flowers, and the flames to signify. To signify charged political anxieties, many of them unnameable in everyday discourse. To signify the aspiration that from the ashes might arise a distinctly local new South African sense of community, nationality, inclusion. The question painted is how? How did those flowers and flames come to me mean so much? What future terrors did they speak to? First, the flowers. Flowers have long served as national emblems. The giant protea, which is typical of this flame horse I was talking about, has been South Africa's emblem for many years. It stands in a relationship that anthropologists call totemic, right, to the nation, a relationship that is of people to nature, of place to species, in which the latter enriches the former, so long as it is respected, venerated, and not wantonly consumed. But it's also a kind of fetish, a natural displacement of emotionally charged identities, roots in act, rooted in acts of ethno-national assertion. Now, it is not always so. The very use of the term famous for this indigenous plant of this Cape region is recent. It was only in the end of the 1960s that the term, and the category to which it now refers, became established either in popular or botanical usage. This was precisely the time when international demand for local flora took off and a national association was formed to market it. Fainbox export is now a huge industry, and there's huge investment in it. It was also the point at which statement, statesmen began to talk about this as a national asset, yeah. and at, at which botanists first assisted, um, asserted sorry, that the fragile species was worthy of conservation as a unique biome type. Not long before that, in 1953, an authority on the subject had actually described fables as the invader, which threatened what had been there before. So what is now said of aliens was being said half a century before of this national treasure, this passionately protected icon of nation and natural rootedness. But it's not just this fragile natural heritage that Fainbos has captured the imagination of the South African public. It is also as a protagonist locked in mortal struggle with invasive aliens that threaten to take over its habitat and choke off its means of survival. A parenthetical note here. Similar anxieties about plant invaders have manifested themselves in many Western nations as well, often in places also where there is a concern with immigration. Um, in the US, for instance, yeah, in Southern California, in Australia, where ironically South African plants are demonized, but also in Britain, where huge expanses of rhododendrons, which were very popular in national trust properties, have now suddenly been deemed non-national and large amounts of money are being raised to remove them because they actually come from Southeast Asia and they're not in the top of <laughs> Now, time was when there was great enthusiasm for non-indigenous vegetation. In the high colonial age, British rulers encouraged the import of exotics for what was seemed at, seemed at the time to be good modern ecological reasons. It took a long while for desirable imports to be redefined as invasive <coughs> aliens, and these are all terms I've taken from the British, pests, colonizers, even green cancers. And it was only in the 1990s that aliens came to be held largely accountable for the fragility of this cake landscape. This is abundantly clear in the way in which attitudes to fire in this landscape, famous, have shifted over the past decade, culminating in the catastrophe of January 2000. Now, as we've said, fires are endemic in this region. Expert opinion acknowledges that the conservation of biodiversity actually depends on fire. What is more, in the past, foreign plants were only one of the factors <coughs> to produce fires of various kinds. In fact, various reports don't even mention them. Neither remember did public blame in the first place in 2000 alight immediately on them, although when it did, they became a burning preoccupation. Fire, after all, is one of the most elemental embodiments of transformative energy light, heat and destruction, purification. Fire often smoulders in the colonial memory as a kind of brute means of violence and conflict available as much to the powerless and the powerful. And there is a huge preoccupation with the danger of fire uh, in the South African imagination. But what has this to do with aliens? Until the fall of apartheid, the term alien had archaic connotations in South Africa. 
being enshrined in laws aimed at barring Jewish entry in the 1930s. These laws remained in place until amended in the mid-1990s, when immigrants became a fraught issue in a society seething with the surplus of unemployed people. It was at the same time that foreign plants became both a subject of ecological emergency and an object of national renewal. The most striking symptom of this was the Working for Water program, launched in 1995. Part of the National Post-Apartheid Reconstruction and Development Plan, the scheme was a flagship project to create jobs and combat poor poverty, and it centered on routing alien vegetation. Unemployed women, youth, and ex-offenders, even the homeless, would be rehabilitated by joining these eradication teams. People rounded up on the streets to go out and route the alien in people's gardens and so on. Alien nation, at nature, in other words, was pictured to be the raw material of communal rebirth. The blaze in Cape Town gave, gave further impetus to this process. As popular feeling focused on the foreign scourge, the state itself seemed intent on coaxing a spirit of community from the ashes. Ever more overt official connections were made between the war against these aliens and the prosperity of the nation. But the most portentous words of all were spoken by then President Mbeki, who had an international conference on this topic in the middle of all of this. Alien plants, he said, stand in the way of the African Renaissance. You see, the government picks up on this. And so invading plants became embroiled in the state of the nation. But this still does not answer our key question. To what precise anxieties, interests, and historical conditions does this allegory of alien nations speak? And the answer is to be found in a cluster of implicit associations and images in the public discourse that reveal the infrastructure of popular consciousness under construction. Processes of naturalization make it possible then to voice the unspeakable, to broach the challenge of conceiving a nation amidst all that's going on with liberalization and open borders in the wake of the recent transformations of what of which I spoke earlier. Take the satirical comment by a well-known South African journalist, and I quote, Doubtless there are gardening writers who would not think twice about sounding off in blissful praise about something as innocent as the jacaranda tree. But be careful, behind those blossoms and splendid flowers, the jacaranda is nothing but a water-hogging, weed-spreading alien. Now, once the jacaranda had been described as South Africa's national truth, now in a bizarre drama in which plants signify what politics struggles to name, it's become an object of estrangement, even rationalization. Some even spoke of ethnically cleansing the countryside. This in a land obsessed with constitutional rights and wrongs, with routing poor vestiges of racism. But it was a wry letter from a West African scholar to a prominent national newspaper that made the political subtext most rooted in play. And I quote, Aha, he writes, it is alien bashing time again. As an alien, I'm particularly prickly about criticisms of other aliens, even if they plants. But before the Department of Home Affairs investigates the residence permits of these plants, I, as a concerned fellow alien, wish to remind one and all that plants such as maize, soya bean, and sunflower also originate outside the continent of Africa. These are the main staples of in any case, did the fire and flood causing alien plants cross the border and establish plantations by themselves? Now, for this human alien, ecology had become the site of a distressingly familiar crusade. The demonization of migrants by the state and citizenry alike. How long we wondered, as we witnessed the rising temperature of this rhetoric in all the newspapers around us, how long before the metaphorical spark would leap the species barrier? from the plants and in light onto the human objects to which it had long been reaching. Now it has been noted that the migrant is the spectre on whose wretched fate the triumphal politics of the new Europe has been founded. Many journalists have made this point about Europe. 